Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, coming along. Um, I hope you can all see my screen fine. We tested it earlier, so it should all be good to go. I'm going to start by doing a, a very brief overview of the Highland Archive Service, just a couple of slides to explain a little bit about uh, who we are and where we are before coming on to talk about women in the collections. So uh, a very quick overview, if you've come to these before, then you'll be uh, very familiar with this, but just always helpful, I think, to locate ourselves in the subject, what we're talking about. So archives is, is one of those words that we throw around all the time uh, in our job and then forget sometimes people don't know exactly what the difference is between an archive and a library, for example. So archives are the original records of official bodies, companies, societies and individuals. So generally speaking, we don't hold published material in an archive because that's held in a library and we don't hold objects because those are held in museums, although there are, of course, little exceptions to both of those. Um, an archive can be at any age, so we have things that are centuries old in our collections. The oldest thing we have is from the 1200s and right through to things that were created last week. So the examples there of a First World War pass and of a uh, 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 a letter from King uh, James II, 1455, uh, to do with the borough of Fortrose. They can be of any uh, uh, extent as well. So we have collections that are just one document and we have collections that are hundreds of boxes of documents. Largely, the material we hold is paper and parchment. That uh, tends to be what archives uh, are, are bought of. Um, but we also hold tens of thousands of maps and photographs and uh, videos, DVD files, Betamax, reel-to-reel -reel tapes and all sorts of other uh, types of material. The main thing is that these are things that have been identified as being worthy of permanent preservation because they're irreplaceable and they form a unique record of our past. Where possible, archives need to be preserved in secure and environmentally controlled conditions and that's not always possible for a lot of, uh, a lot of people but it is for us. The Highlands is a huge area, so we cover a third of Scotland's land mass, uh, the largest local authority in Britain by quite some way. Um, and so in order to best serve that community, we have four archive centres that enable us to preserve, conserve and make accessible the historic documents relating to the Highlands of Scotland. We have a dedicated family history centre. We have a specialist conservation studio to repair our documents. And we run a big programme of events and open days throughout the year. We also run and develop Ambala from within the Highland Archive Service. Uh, Ambala is a digital archive of uh, material from the Highland Archive Service collections, but also from other external uh, organisations. It's a very, very useful resource, much like Scran um, that Joe mentioned in the introduction, really useful. So we have a, a very busy programme of things that we deliver across our four archive centres. And these are those four archive centres. So the one on the top left is in Inverness, the one on the top right in Caithness and Wick, bottom left in Fort William in Loch Aber, and the bottom right in Portree covering Skye and Loch Elsh. So together the four of those make up the Highland Archive Service. So again, quite unusual that we would have four centres. I mentioned that where possible it's important for archives to be kept in secure conditions and all four of our archive centres have that um, ability so we all have purpose-built constructed strong rooms that are temperature controlled that are secure. Um, I'm laughing because I was showing some children in the other day and they, they always think that we have the movable racking for trapping the burglars in um, which we've never yet had to do. We also have within each of our four buildings archive search rooms that give public access to people to use those collections during regular opening hours. So again, fortunate to have that public space as well as that um, secure controlled space for the documents. I mentioned that we have a family history centre, so we offer one to one consultations on family history in person and also online via Zoom email and different, uh, all sorts of different platforms. So you can use that service wherever you are in the world. We have a remote inquiry service for people who are unable to visit. And we also run online classes in family history for beginners, in advanced family history, 
and in archives for beginners because again you're kind of aware that you throw around these words like uh, valuation roles or borough charters or whatever it might be and sometimes it's quite useful to have uh, a guided insight into what those are and how to use them. I mentioned that we have a conservation service so that allows us to repair our own documents but also to offer that as a service for external clients. And we run a very uh, broad outreach program through the year. So we work regularly with the local university, the Highlands and Islands. We work with the prison service. We work with uh, large numbers of, uh, of the 205 schools that are in Highland. And we deliver summer activities for school children as well. So we do things like using uh, maps or other archive material to play games and be creative. We've done a lot of digital engagement, particularly since COVID, like so many other people. Um, we were kind of forced into a position where we needed to do that, and that's turned very much to our advantage. So we now do uh, regular blogs, posts on our, particularly on our Nucleus page, the Caithness Archive, around stories from the collections there. We deliver online talks and online exhibitions. And as Joe mentioned, we've done Learn with Lorna now, just going into the fourth year of Learn with Lorna with 146 episodes. So they go out on Thursdays at 11 o'clock on Facebook, subsequently uploaded to YouTube. And if you haven't seen any of them, they tell stories from our collections along different themes, different subjects, and all of them can be viewed back on our Facebook and YouTube pages. So if you want to catch up with those, please do so. And please come and join our wee Lerma Dorna family on a Thursday morning. Okay, so that's a, a very sort of quick whistle stop tour of, of what the Highland Archive Service is and does, just so you know where we are in the world and, and the sort of things we do. But to come on to talk particularly about the women who are represented in these collections, that's what I'm going to do next. I've broken it into uh, examples of women at work, at leisure, um, women coming up against the law, different things like that, uh, to try and segment it in a way that is hopefully interesting. So we have examples in our collections of women in the workplace and that might be examples like this where women are in what's, what are traditionally seen as the kind of female uh, roles and professions. So this is a manual of midwifery from 1768. It's held in the Highland Archive Centre in Inverness and it describes the history of midwifery and the roles played by women in that profession. And it says on this extract here, midwifery, though very ancient, is a science that has been extremely little cultivated. It was practiced only by women who were extremely illiterate and had no opportunity of being instructed. Women were not only employed for the operations, but likewise consulted on all diseases of women. Men were only called in on extraordinary cases and diseases so that they were more ignorant even than the women. By this means, the operations were always dangerous. About the middle of the last century, the women in France began to employ men, but it was only by, by the by and not common, and none applied themselves wholly to this branch, and so its improvements were very slow. It's received more improvements within these last 30 years than it did all the time before. Had the world known of the mischief sometimes done by midwives, they would have applied themselves to it more carefully. Really interesting to, to find a document that is 300 years old, that's looking back uh, further than that about the improvements that they're seeing then in 1768, but looking back at the kind of ignorance uh, in, their, in their phrase before that, and all the mischief, the damage that an, a midwife who is not adequately trained could provide. There are some very interesting examples of this uh, in our collections, talking about the role that women played in childbirth as uh, nurses and midwives. And of course, we know that there is still a huge imbalance between um, me male medicine and female medicine. Carrying on that theme, there are some later examples of women in nursing and midwifery. The picture on the left hand side is from our Highland Health Board collection. We hold the, these records, a huge collection on behalf of NHS Highland. And 
the, the images within this collection of nurses are always really well loved. Everybody loves the nurses' pictures and we quite often have people identifying themselves in them. We had a day, uh, an open day once, particularly for, for nurses and ex-nurses, and it was it was great fun with lots of, uh, lots of lots of nurses shoving each other out the way to find themselves in the pictures. Um, what I find particularly notable about that one is the fact that all of the nurses are wearing their uniform for their Christmas dinner, which seems a little bit um, strange to me, <laughs> but uh, there we go. But a, a great collection of records, information on nurses training and on uh, patients that they dealt with, and then some great photographic collections like this. On the right hand side is one of my favourite pictures, particularly because I just think she's so striking looking. And this is Flora Ferguson. And Flora Ferguson was from the Strathetic Nursing Association. The image is taken in around the 1920s. And she was known or is known to us as the first mechanised district nurse. So when the Highlands and Islands Medical Service was established in 1912, which was a huge landmark piece of legislation, the introduction of the first state-sponsored healthcare system in the world, one of the provisos that came out of that or one of the ambitions that came out of that was to increase the ability of nurses to travel and um, whether that was giving them uh, things like this, like this motorbike, to enable them to better get out and serve their community. And so Flora Ferguson became one of the first mechanised nurse, district nurses. And there she is there with her motorbike, looking particularly um, like something out of an Agatha Christie, but also notable and, and loved by a lot of people because it has the local number plate on it, ST, which is the Inverness Your number plate. So we can find examples of women in, as I say, those kind of traditionally perceived female roles of nursing and midwifery. But we can also find examples of women in other professions like the arts. This is a letter written by Evelyn Barron when she was just a little girl. Now, Evelyn Barron, if people are watching locally, that may be a name that they know in and around Inverness. But for those of you who don't know, I'll tell you a little bit about Evelyn's story. Evelyn Barron was born in 1913 and she was one month old when her mother, Evelyn, died. Now, the baby Evelyn hadn't actually been christened that, but it was her name was changed after her mother died. She was then only three when her father went off to fight in the First World War and died at the Battle of Luz. So she was, by the age of three, an orphan. We have a huge number of letters between her parents as they were courting and as they got married and as they were found they were expecting this baby. And then when one died and then the other died. Evelyn was then brought up by her uncle Evan and her aunt Gladys. Uncle Evan um, is Evan Barron, who's particularly well known in around the Highlands and Islands as a historian and writer. She attended Inverness Royal Academy and Heatherley School for Girls and uh, went on to St Leonard's School in Fife and then Edinburgh University. And it's from her school days that this little letter appears. And she's writing to her uncle Evan. My dear unk, she says, what did you think of yourself and Auntie Gladys? Um, I, I love I love that she calls him Unk and then what did you think of yourself and Auntie Gladys? Um, ask Auntie Gladys what she thought of you and her coming back from the town. And then she finishes it, I saw an air an aeroplane today, tons of love, Bev. And there's another letter in which she says uh, that she's doing terribly at school but she's having a great time, she's not remotely bothered. The Barron family owned the Inverness Courier. They had done for a couple of generations by this point. Um, they had initially started as editors and then became the owners of the paper. And in 1935, Evelyn Barron joined the Inverness Courier, going on in World War II to serve in the Women's Royal Naval Service in Aden and in New Zealand before coming back to carry on working at the Inverness Courier, which she became editor of in 1965, one of the first female editors in Britain. And she carried out that role until 1988 and died shortly afterwards. And it's thanks to her that we have this extensive collection of letters relating to the Inverness Courier and the Baron family. This is one of my favourite uh, ladies in our collections. This is Meg McDougall. Meg, or Margaret, was born and raised in Inverness. 
she was a huge expert in a huge number of things. She was renowned for having a huge amount, a vast amount of knowledge on local history, on Jacobites, on clans and tartans and silver and various other things. She took a very active role in society in Inverness and in supporting the community. She was involved in the setting up of a number of organisations and the running of them, including the Citizens Advice Bureau, the Society of Antiquaries for Scotland and the Culloden Committee for the National Trust. So you can see using that extensive knowledge to uh, support and work with other people. She was a very, very avid researcher, and this is why I love her. She was um, a, an authority on local place names and incidents, on buildings, of schools, churches, um, all the different roles within the Inverness uh, Town Council, the story of the hangman and the, uh, the executioner and the clacknacud and stone and fairies and myth and lore and all sorts of different things. And to me, in my role as community engagement, I spend a lot of time taking stories from our collections into the prison or into schools or into TV programmes, different things. And I go to Meg often as a conduit to find answers to information because I know that there's no point me going from scratch on the subject when odds are Meg may well have done it 50, 60, 70 years ago. She was curator for Inverness Museum and Art Gallery and joint Inverness County and Borough Librarian until she died in 1960 and I was absolutely delighted to be giving a talk recently where someone told me that they remembered Meg and knew all about her and that was uh, lovely. Here's another example of some women in the arts in our collections. These two ladies that you can see at the top of your screen are Katrina and Myra MacDonald. They are uh, fondly known as the MacDonald sisters. Their parents were Dougald MacDonald and Margaret MacKinnon from Skye, so both parents' families were rooted in Skye. But the girls themselves were born in Karachi in India before going on to study at Harrow School of Art. They travelled extensively and they lived in South Africa and various other places. So you can see that already from a young age, they have experienced a lot of the world. In May 1943, both of them were elected as fellows in the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce. And you can see some of their work on, on your screen. So they designed things like wallpapers, uh, designs for vases, as you can see, illustrated poetry, so the image with the swan on it, and I don't know how big your screen is that you're watching on, but um, on the bottom second left hand one, there's an, an image of a, a, a swan. And they have both drawn that and, and written a piece of writing around it in English and in Gaelic, designing fabrics like this dress and images that you can see have clearly drawn inspiration from their time in India and in South Africa. It's a fantastic collection and one that we hold the copyright for, so all sorts of potential of what we could do with the, the images in this collection. So we've looked there at some of those kind of traditional female roles. We've looked at women in the arts. One of the roles, perhaps within the Highlands, that we most associate women working at in the past are the fisherwives and the herring girls. And this is a hard, hard, brutal life long hours of women often coming from other places, often coming from the Western Isles to follow the herring as it, uh, as it, they, the herring trade moved around the coast. So they would go to Wick and spend time and come down the coast, maybe to Helmsdale, carry on down into places like Great Yarmouth and other places. So actually in their own way as well, the herring girls travelled extensively. But it's a hard, hard job. It's as you can see, even just from the angles they're all bending at, it's a hard physical job. And they're taking the herring catch and salting it, putting it into barrels. So it's, as I say, a hard physical job. And if you look at this image on the left hand side, you can see, uh, hopefully you can see that of those three herring girls in that picture, every one of them has their hands bandaged. And you can imagine they're often cutting their hands as they're as they're cutting and gutting the fish but also they're then having to put those fish in salt to preserve it so that they, we can imagine the pain on their hands and that image on the right hand side which comes from uh, our collections on Ambala you can see just how 
busy a working environment it is, how many women are there, but also how different our coastline used to look, particularly in and around Wick, but so many of these coastal towns. So we've looked a little bit at women at work. We also have women in conflict in our collections. Of course, during World War I, the Highlands, as well as elsewhere, women joined the workforce. And this particular image that's on the screen now is from our Rose Street Foundry collection. This is a, a large, extensive collection of business records from Rose Street Foundry, which went on to become AI Welders. This is from 1918, and it shows women working as munitions workers. You can see that they're uh, on war service because they have tiny triangular brooches on their breasts. And those are brooches that's, that are on war service brooches. It shows that they were working in support of the war effort. They were individually numbered and they were given exclusively to female munitions workers from 1916 onwards. It's a great image, that one. There are also stories of individual women in the First World War. So these are some extracts from the papers of Christina Keith. Christina Keith was born and raised in Thurso in Caithness, and she was the older sister to the artist David Barragill Keith. And we have David Barragill Keith's papers as well as Christina's. She had a real passion for learning and education and the possibilities that those could bring. And as a result of that, she went in the First World War, took part in the army's education scheme teaching the troops different languages. She was one of the first women to travel along the battlefields, if not the first woman, to go to the front and walk the battlefields with a companion who she refers to only as the hut lady in her diaries. And she wrote about her experiences in a memoir that she published in, uh, titled A Fool in France. And it was published subsequently, um, but it's quite extraordinarily written. It describes in great detail her experience of the war, the impact it had on her walking along the front, the impact it had on her meeting young men one day and then visiting their graves the next day. And she talks at one point about um, planting roses around the site where they're buried. And she says, I planted red roses, red, uh, and I hope that they will grow in a memory read for the blood that was spilt, and I hope that they'll grow in a memory of the love that was lost for them. Of course, in World War II, women served as well. And these pictures are fantastic, again, from our Road Street Foundry collection. You can see on the right side one that's very much like a sort of typical Rosie the Riveter sort of publicity photograph. Two young women having a break outside the factory in the middle one. But on the left hand side, quite an extraordinary photograph of women making chain in their high-heeled slingback shoes, skirts, head scarves. Um, they've, they've signed up to support the war effort, but they're still, um, there's still no expectation to, to dress for the occasion. So again, there are those kind of big collections that talk about women as a whole working, but there are also examples of individual women's contribution, like Christina Keith in World War I. Here's another example. Tooney MacDonald in World War II. Tooney was known uh, as Tooney, but her, her name was Joanna Campbell MacDonald. She was born in 1885 and she was the daughter of Harry MacDonald of Viewfield and Flora MacKinnon of Kailakin. So again, rooted in that West Coast community in Skye and Kailakin. She had a keen interest as a result of that in the social life of Skye. And when the Second World War broke out, she became commandant for the, for the Red Cross for the whole of Skye. She was also commissioner of the Girl Guides, a very accomplished musician, and therefore the first president of the Common Pibrach Nanilan Skianach, which is the um, piping association of Skye. During both World Wars, she was involved in organising Spagnum Moss collections, which were often gathered by school pupils, um, collections of moss that would then be used as dressings for the soldiers. And she organised penny a week for Sky and raised thousands of pounds as a result of it. She also founded the Portree Amateur Dramatic Club, of which she was president. Apparently there was um, some people who wrote about her at the time of her life saying that she took great uh, joy in being uh, at the centre of the stage. 
uh, in the drill hall in Portree. So all of these uh, women who are taking their, their role, taking what they can to do to support both their local community, but also the war effort. This is one of my absolute favourite people in our collections. This is Hetty Munro. I always think she's um, just got a really beautiful face and really of its, of its time face. Hetty was born uh, in Thurso, again, on the 26th of October, 1912. So she is much like Tooney, she's supporting the war effort in World War II, but she's coming at it 20, 30 years old, uh, younger than Tooney. And so her role would be different. She was the eldest of her family. She had two brothers, Ian and Alistair, and she served in the ATS, the te uh, sorry, Auxiliary Territorial Service in various places, but particularly in Orkney. And she kept uh, extensive diaries and wrote lots of articles about her time. She became Montgomery's aide-de-camp. And after the war, she finished, uh, after the war finished, she returned to Thurso to look after her mother. But I wanted to tell you quickly a war story that happened to her before, before the war ended. You can see her there in that picture in the bottom of her in her kilt and actually on the left hand side as well I think she's in her kilt and that's a drawing by her in her diary of herself marching along at high speed. Um, and so they would wear their Caithness tartan when they were on duty. When she went to apply for a promotion she had to go to London to apply for the promotion to be interviewed and the rule was that they couldn't wear their Caithness tartan out with the county boundaries. And she wasn't very happy about this. She said that she was absolutely going to wear her, her tartan if she wanted to. So she describes in her diary how she went all the way to London, flew down and wore her great coat over the top of her kilt so nobody would see it. But she said she hadn't prepared for how much hotter London would be than Wick. <laughs> and so she said she sat sweltering in this office waiting to go in for an interview, but she refused to take her coat off. And then when she went through for the interview, she tore her coat off and stood there in her Caithness kilt and went in and applied for the job. And she got the job, but they said to her, don't ever do that again. But that's, to me, that's Hetty all over. She's one of those women that makes you wonder what she would have done if she hadn't done what so many others did, uh, which was return home to care for her mother, which I'm absolutely sure she didn't uh, resent in any way, but you just wonder what else she she would have done. However, she did still go on to do something uh, extraordinary. She opened an antique shop, the ship's wheel, with her brother Alistair. And then when Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, bought the Castle of May, her Caithness home, in 1952, Hetty and Alexander found the furniture for her, and as a result, they were granted a royal warrant and the Queen Mother used to go and visit both the shop and them at home whenever she was in the Castle of May. And Hetty died in 1989. You might think from what I've said so far that the pre predominantly what we have in our collections, or maybe you think exclusively what we have in our collections, is a story of women with money. And there's some truth in that, in that generally it tends to be people who have had enough money to create a load of archival records that, that have left that legacy. And so there are lots of women like the ones in these photographs in our collections. These are from uh, a scrapbook of Mary Gwendolyn Mackenzie, who married Duncan Davidson of Tullock. So she was a wealthy lady. And you can see in these pictures, this is them going to the Northern Meeting Ball in about 1900. So some very, very posh uh, ladies in these pictures. But it's interesting, whenever I have used these pictures with children and I ask, do you think that these people are wealthy or do you think these people are poor? Often children will say, we think they're poor because they look so sad and they look so unhappy. And you have to explain that people, about people staying very still for photographs. It's easier to hold a, a serious face than a happy face. So we do have lots of examples of women with a lot of money in our collections. These are some examples of account books from the 1780s and uh, into the 1800s. These are the account books of a lady called Susanna Pope. And you can see the kind of wealth, the kind of things they're spending money on. So there's carriages, there's postage for things, there's presents, there's food, things like 
uh, rhubarb. She's buying books and poems and almanacs and things like that, gloves and shoes and clogs. So you can use even just a document like that. You won't get the whole story of the person's life, but you will get a glimpse into the kind of money they have and what they're using it for. Women like this. This is Veer Hobart on the left hand side. She um, is exactly an example of these women with uh, substantial amounts of money who then marry into families with substantial amounts of money. So Veer Hobart married into the Cameron of Lochiel family. But the reason she's particularly notable is actually nothing to do with that. She's notable in our collections because she had a relationship of some description with uh, Anne Lister, who was known as the world's first modern lesbian. And these letters in our collections are from Anne Lister. And you can see at the top that they're dated, uh, that they're addressed from Shipton Hall in 1832 and 1836. And these are letters written by Anne Lister to Veer when she found out that Veer was getting married. So predominantly, yes, these are stories of, of women with money, but also there are examples of women at the other end of that um, financial spectrum. This is the general register of the poor for the parish of Alvey from 1846 to 1930. And this is an example from 1895, the example of Jane McBain. She is listed there as a domestic servant who is wholly disabled by insanity. And it says this person was removed from London to her sister's house in Edinburgh, where she became chargeable as a pauper lunatic uh, in, uh, that, in that year, 1895. And people sometimes ask me if I feel any discomfort about talking about people in the asylum or people in the poor relief system. And the first thing is we never talk about anybody within the last hundred years. So it will always be at least a hundred years ago. But also, I don't feel discomfort about it because I think that people who have had a raw deal in life, for whatever reason that might be, deserve to be talked about and remembered as much as those people who have had money and good fortune. Um, I think their lives are just as valid to be remembered. So that's an example there of somebody who's 30 years old and considered insane. This is another example from the Urquhart um, General Register of Poor. And this is an example of a, a widow at the age of 80 who's described as um, still having a, a job in farming, but also that she's partially disabled by her age. So you can get an idea of women across the age range as well in these records. I wanted to talk a little bit about women and the law and how women interact with the law. Having a look in our court papers, you can find some stories of this. This is from our high court collections. These are the process papers of the courts. And this describes what happened when a group of young women, or a group of women, sorry, became involved in an assault on an excise officer. So the excise officer, John Proudfoot, had turned up, he discovered an illicit whiskey still and he had turned up trying to confiscate bags of malt that would be used in the distilling process. And it says he found himself surrounded by a mob of women and girls who began to pelt him with stones and told him that they would not permit him to carry off the malt. They did everything in their power to stop him, although eventually he took a knife to the sacks and scattered the malt about. So he obviously thought, well, I can't take them, but the, these bags of malt, but at least I'm going to destroy them, make them not usable anymore. And he probably thought he had the last laugh, but on returning to the place where he'd left his saddle, bridle, stick and great coat, he found all of these things had been cut up and damaged. He also had to be attended by a surgeon for 10 days because of his cuts and bruises. And the women involved were Janet Young, Margaret Cunningham, Jane Munro or Calder, Anne Fraser and Margaret McLennan. So sometimes you can see examples of women in the court records. Sometimes they don't even have to do anything to be warned about it. And if uh, anyone was listening to Learn with Lorna this morning, I referred to this document. Um, this is from the Northern Constabulary Order and Memorandum Book sent by the Chief Constable to the police forces, warning them to, to be on their guard against suffragettes. This is from 
1913. And it says that in view of the vast amount of damage done by suffragettes and other irresponsible creatures to property throughout the kingdom, and the possibility of their extending their operations into this county by way of setting fire to houses, plantations and moors, I'm desirous that the police keep close observation on all strange women and known local ones likely to be influenced by strangers. So you can find these glimpses to women coming up in conflict with the law. And related to that, we have some records uh, connected to women taking a stand about something. So for instance, many of you I'm sure will know the name of Mary Vorna Noren. She was born Mary MacDonald in 1821 in Skye, but she left Skye for Inverness in 1847. She was widowed by the age of 18, uh, by, widowed by the year 1871 and left with four children. She was imprisoned for a short time in 1872 on a charge of stealing from her employer, stealing a piece of clothing from her employer, which she always resolutely denied. She always protested her innocence. And in a way of expressing her outrage about the way she had been treated and the humiliation she'd suffered, she started writing poetry and expressing her anger through Gaelic verse and song. When she was released, she left Inverness and went to Glasgow where she trained as a nurse and worked there until 1882. But it was while she was in Glasgow that she got to know some of the leading people involved in Highland land reform. She had witnessed so much injustice and inequality, she felt that she wanted to be part of this group that was uh, kind of advocating against it. And she did this through attending the Highland Society Cayleys. As a result of that, when she returned to Skye, she became the official bard of the Land League agitation of the 1880s, and she remains famous for her songs and poems of protest and passion. In 1821, so going back a few years from Mary Vorn and Oren, but one of the things that she was, was kind of that anger and that frustration of hers was feeding on was incidents like this. In 1820, Munro of Navarre, one of the landowners of, of Ross and Cromarty, made moves to clear the tenants from his farm in those waves of Highland clearances that were happening. He wanted to clear the tenants of the parish, uh, of the estate of Colrain, to make way for a sheep farm. And this was ended up in what was called the Colrain Riots. And we hold some letters that talk about this. What happened when they, he and various others turned up to give those um, those orders to the tenants to instruct them to vacate their land. About 70 of them, 70 militia and constables were sent to quell the resistance in Corrine as people stood up against their enforced eviction. And in this account, which he's writing an eyewitness account just after the event, he says that they were opposed by an infuriated mob of about 150 women or men dressed as women with about 40 or 50 men amongst them and on a height behind them, there was another 200 men drawn up, all, if uh, many, if not all of them, with muskets. In the end, the militia were forced to retreat without handing in those notices to give those people their eviction notices, because they were thrown, these men and women threw so many stones and missiles at them that he had to escape to his carriage. And he says in outrage that several stones came in the window and one of them even hit him. Um, and he says this is an act of rebellion and says that if you want me to go back and tell these people that they need to be cleared and all these 150 women, I'm not going back unless I have a force of 500 soldiers plus field artillery with me. Um, and in the end, that particular estate was never cleared. Here's another striking woman in our collections, again, one of my favourites. This is Lady Constance Mackenzie. She was the daughter of the late Earl of Cromarty and, and I'm seeing there that I've spelt Cromarty with a Y and not an IE. Um, and she was the niece of the Duke of Sutherland. The reason I love Constance is she just basically refused to do exactly what she was told to do. So she wore kilts, she wore trousers, she refused to follow exactly what was expected of a young lady. She rode astride, which was very notable, and people talked about it in the newspaper, uh, 
she took part in shooting and fencing and swimming and she played the pipes and danced and won competitions for her sporting achievements such as the bath club swimming shield she competed in the presence of the king because she was at such a high level she's described in the newspaper as being a champion swimmer a capital shot and devoid of any sort of conventionality and a law unto herself which is not a bad uh, description i think she became married uh, she she got married in april 1904 to a man called Sir Austin, Sir Edward Austin Stuart Richardson, who was a captain in the Black Watch. And one of the funniest things about this is that the wedding was completely unexpected. Her family and friends thought that she was still engaged to somebody else. And so as a result, none of her family were in attendance. Excuse me, sorry, I'm gonna get a cough. Um, she went on to, to marry a second time after Sir Stuart Richardson's death, before going on to lead a semi-naked dance troupe around the world. She died in 1932, having spent her life as being devoid of any sort of conventionality. And then we also have examples of women having fun. So that can be something as simple as this, an image of the Och football, women's football team which is part of the Och Heritage Collection that we care for on their behalf. They give us the entire collection. And this uh, fantastic image of the women's football team. Or it could be something like this. And if you remember that AI uh, image of the women making the chain in their skirts, this seems like an equally ludicrous outfit to be wearing. This, if you remember the artists I spoke about right at the beginning, the two sisters, the artists, this is their mother, Maggie MacDonald, uh, Maggie McKinnon, skiing in Switzerland in the 1930s with her husband and with the two girls. But yes, quite an extraordinary outfit to wear. It looks freezing. There are images like this from the Maud, 1956, uh, this particular year being held in Perth, and the names of all the women there in that photo, Flora, Chrissy, Peggy, Chris, Chrissy and Norma, looking like they're having a, a great time getting ready to sing in the choir. We have in, in examples of uh, things like this. So these are examples of the Och Herring Queen being crowned in 1955. And examples like that from right across the Highlands of those kind of community based um, activities that, that take the whole community together. But we also have examples of women in private. So those last pictures I showed are very kind of public community based, but we also have women in private in our collections. So for instance, uh, this is the diary of Anne Fraser. Anne Fraser was a governess and she, amongst other people, was governess to the children of the Earl of Buchan. She had been born in the Black Isle, so she spent most of her childhood and young years in around Och and Cromarty. She was born there in, 19, in 1804. All we have of Anne Fraser is one diary, and I knew very little about it until I focused on it for a Learn with Lorna recently, which meant that I did a huge amount of more research into her life, which was incredibly rewarding. Her diary, as I say, is the one thing we have of hers. It dates from 1816 to 1832, and it contains a huge, huge amount of, of information about her life, about the impact of loss, of death, about education, about travel and transport and illness, a huge amount of information from the early uh, 19th century. Another diary we have is the diary of Sylvia Blaine. Sylvia Blaine's family came from Windsor. They were based in, uh, in and around Windsor in the south of England, and they had a holiday home in Nairn, up on the coast, just a few miles from where I am. I tend to speak more often about her brother, Malcolm Blaine. Um, there was a, a family of, of four children and I tend to usually speak about Malcolm Blaine because Malcolm, we have seven of his diaries from I think about the age of eight to about the age of 12 and they're bursting with life and enthusiasm and passion. And the reason I use them often is because Malcolm, having had this explosive, full, exciting childhood, died very, very young in the First World War. And so we, I use that a lot with school children to kind of explain 
the, the story behind each of the lives that were lost in World War One. And so I hadn't spent a huge amount of time in Sylvia's diaries until, again, I came to write about it. I, I, I select myself what I'm going to do for Learn With Lorna's and I wanted to look at Sylvia Blaine. And so, again, I came to read them from cover to cover and learn more about Sylvia. This particular extract um, was written when she was about 14 or 15 years old, and it gives a description of a suffrage meeting which her mother held in around 1913. Um, she describes her mother holding the suffrage meeting, which was a great success, and there were 150 people at it. And later on, she writes really passionately about another meeting that she attended, where Miss Muriel Matters, who was a well-known Australian-born uh, actress, who was one of the big leading lights of the suffragette movement in Britain, she spoke, and Sylvia was very inspired. And Sylvia wrote in her diary what Muriel had said. No real reform can be made by legislation or outward pressure. True reform must come from within. People must realise the unity of all humanity and that every soul is equal in the sight of God. That this movement is only part of the great worldwide spiritual movement for the freedom of expression. Sylvia was very close to her brother Malcolm and when he died in the First World War, her diary becomes increasingly erratic as she's so frightened about him. Um, him go, first of all going to war and then his the diary finishes just weeks before he died so I don't know how she reacted to it but I can only imagine given how frightened she was of him going. So you can see hopefully that we have within our collections stories of women from across the social spectrum, women across the centuries who have left a mark in the records and who have left a mark in the lives and hearts and the story of the Highlands and Islands. So I hope that has been of interest and I'm going to stop drinking and I'm going to have a drink, uh, stop talking and have a drink before I cough any further. But thank you very much for listening to me.